What's up, internet? It's me, Jake Cobrin, and you are listening to another episode of the Quarantine Sessions podcast. I began to record episodes for this podcast at the beginning of the year 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, and the inspiration behind these podcasts was to provide a platform for the pillars and leaders of my community to share their voice and to help construct an inspiring narrative for people in this time of crisis when a need for the upliftment of the spirit has been at its most urgent. This podcast centers around themes of art, creativity, spirituality, and psychedelics. And the incredible people I've had conversations with are all people who have bravely stepped outside of the conventional way of thinking and the conventional way of being and have transcended the matrix of the default reality, living life on their own terms. They are all people I respect deeply, and it has been an amazing opportunity and a privilege to speak to and learn from them. Most of these podcasts have been recorded live through Instagram, which is a new and somewhat experimental medium to conduct podcasts. I truly hope you enjoy this podcast and continue to tune in for future episodes. It's really a labor of love on my part. And thank you so much again for listening. Without further ado, here's the show. This episode today is with Paul Masvidal. Paul is the founding member of the progressive metal band Cynic, which is a band that had a big impact on me and found me at a perfect time in my life when I was transitioning out of my dark, depressed death metal phase and going towards the light with a greater evolving interest in Buddhism and Cynic's music fit this need perfectly to help unify this polarity. Besides working with Cynic, he has worked with other bands like Aeon Spoke. He was a former guitarist for Death. And he has a solo project, Masvidal, and has worked on albums with Jim Carrey, as well as a session musician, It was a very inspiring conversation. We spoke about Buddhism and mindfulness. We talked a bit about Paul's hospice work and um, staying present in the midst of uncertainty. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you will too. Hey. What's up, man? How are you, man? Good. How you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. The sound. The sound's a little foggy. Is it? Um. Let me see if yeah. I. I have some bowls going in the background here. Let's see if this. How is it now? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you better. How you doing, um, man? I actually have the um, the gla- the phone in a decanter, a coffee thing right now. Um, okay. to hold it up. So I wonder if it's echoing through the mic into the coffee thing. And is it weird? Or is it It's okay? a little weird, but it has extra etheric effect, I think. Oh, uh, that's okay. I think it's very appropriate. For is it? Okay, good. Yeah. Um, how are you? I'm good, man. Yeah, I feel really blessed to be here in Bali. I think that it's probably one of the kindest places that I could be during these circumstances. We have a lot yeah. of freedom and there's not a lot of people here and yeah, the environment is beautiful. How about yeah. you? You're in Ubud or? In Ubud, yeah. And it's just really quiet. I, I'm, like, is it literally there's no one around kind of thing? You're just in a remote place or like what's yeah, the? It's really, I mean, I live outside of Ubud, north of Ubud, about 20 minutes. So where I live is already pretty quiet. But uh, since this whole COVID situation, they're not allowed to get people into Bali. And most of the tourists that were here left. So usually um, there's just like tons and tons of people. 
but it's been really quiet. The streets have been really empty. It's been How really nice. Cool. It's been nice. How so great. I would love it if it could stay like this all the time because sometimes there's just so much energy, so much concentration of people and noise. And even yeah. with the um, even with the Balinese themselves, they do a lot of ceremony, which is uh, powerful, but it's also really noisy and loud. And there's mm -hmm. a state temple right by my house, and they've since restricted large-scale gatherings. Wow. So uh, they haven't been doing that. So, like, the nights have been really quiet, and I've been sleeping really well. Oh, nice. Honestly, it's been, it's been great. I feel some kind of, like, sometimes guilt around that or something, because I yeah. know the situation that other people are in. But yeah. um, I just feel really, you know, grateful and blessed to be where I am right now. How cool. Is it when that temple's noisy, what does it sound like? They like use what? gamelons. You know what a gamelon is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so these really uh, calamitous percussive uh, polyrhythmic instruments that they're just, yeah. they go crazy with it. Wow. And they have, you... I mean, their, their whole idea behind it is to appease the spirit. So they create all this noise to try to scare away evil spirits. Oh. But it, yeah, it's really loud. And uh, some then they have basically these kinds of like uh, psychodramas that they play out with different characters from uh, Balinese Hindu mythology. And mm. so they act out these almost like operas or something where these people like dress in costumes and they enact these bits. Um, but they do it like all the time. And it's, it's all kind of, like, music. And it's, so it's, the, it's with the instruments and percussion and wow. Yeah, it's it's trippy like it's very uh, <laughs> it's very trippy and it's totally normal for them too you know it's like as normal as like christmas or something but it's so like otherworldly that's cool yeah that's really How cool been? i've been well um i you know i'm similarly enjoying the quiet you know being in la it's like it's so lovely it reminds me of what it's like here during the holidays because it's just the streets have been it's been picking up actually in the past week but over the past month that i've been back it's really nice because there's just no one around <laughs> and it's you can just it just it feels you feel it it's just calmer you know there's yeah. just not all this manic energy um and i really i i value silence you know i really do value <laughs> silence and so being in a city like this to access it and to feel it on another level is just uh it's it, it's really nice and you know there is that sense like you're saying of you feel um bad in the sense it's under these circumstances but i'm hoping you know on some level that people are reminded to go inward you know it's obviously that we're being forced to to a degree but people like you and i live in that space most of the time it seems and mostly in an internal realm, um, unless we're doing a show or something, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's interesting to kind of see everyone else having to do that, to stop externalizing and to go in and quiet down. So um, I've, been in, I've been loving this, actually. Because <laughs> it's just, you don't have any, you know, again, it's just less distraction. It's like mini retreat time, at yeah. home, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I saw, um, I listened to a podcast with Jack Kornfield, and that's something that he was saying. He was like, people come to my meditation center and pay thousands of dollars to sit alone in a room. Yeah. With nothing to do. He's like, the whole world is getting that for free totally. right now. Yeah. 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 And same here. I mean, there's many events here which can be distracting. distracting. And I didn't realize how distracted I was by that, um, all these dances and things like that, that I was attending all the time to kind of like participate in this kind of uh, culture scene that we have going on here. But since the situation for the last couple of months, they shut down all the events and all the dances. Mm. And I spent, um, yeah, the vast majority of my time alone, just working on art and uh, learning new things and reading and meditating. And, yeah, it's been uh. really tremendous to kind of get back into that place, which does feel more like my natural state, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think the unnerving aspect, at least for me, is this, 
being somewhat empathic is I feel the collective anxiety, you know, especially that first few weeks, it was like through the roof. And so I was trying to kind of navigate, um, you know, not, not looking at the news because I was just feeling it around me, feeling so much fear. And uh, so it was, it was helpful to kind of, actually the first few weeks that this all happened, I was in a friend's hotel in London um, that I, the tour got canceled. I went to drop off my equipment and ended up in London at a friend's hotel. They just said, come stay. And uh, it was really nice because I was basically alone in a hotel in central London as the, as the city started to quiet down. But I still felt this like, and it was actually surreal going around London and seeing the, the city just empty, you know, just get really dead and quiet. Uh, but, you know, navigating that kind of anxiety that's been hurled, like you just feel it, you're absorbing it, at least I've been, and trying to just transmute it. And I've, I've had these moments of, because, you know, I mean, you probably have felt this as an artist. I saw this little uh, cartoon, like a New Yorker cartoon or something the other day. And it was a, a dude on a rowboat. A friend of mine actually posted it. It's, um, he's like in a rowboat in the middle of the sea and there's just storms and it's like huge shark fins around him. It's just complete terror. And, and then at the bottom it says, time to finish your novel. <laughs> and it's like, you know, there's this paralysis. A lot of artists have felt like you suddenly, because you have this quiet, that you're supposed to be productive and get a lot of shit done. But um, a lot of us, at least me, I know I can feed off the, the energy of a busy city or do you know what I mean? All that. So when it gets really quiet, it's a different thing to work with. You're, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you, maybe those bells and the gamelons were, producing some other you know sure yeah yeah definitely creates some certain uh, like trance state or, or something mm -hmm. like that yeah so i've been i've had that i've had these moments of a little bit of like do i just go into retreat time and journal and like take advantage of that or do I go deep into the work? And, and it's like, I think I've been juggling the two environments creatively, like a lot of guitar playing and a lot of kind of woodshedding and then going into other, you know, the, the organ and just different little things that I'm kind of balancing to juxtapose, like working with this unusual space that the city's been hurled into and collectively, you know, the planet. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a really, it's, fascinating you know it's kind of cool to be alive for this <laughs> yeah it's kind of cool to be alive for I mean, something's happening it's like the season finale or something yeah like that. It's exactly exciting. i mean not to sound again like cold or something but this disruption is a disruption is always helpful it's uh this is the this is the job of, of a good, you know, class if you're trying to a spiritual practice is to disrupt, to, to wake you up, to shake you out of your stupor and your sleep. And we, we, need, to, we need these things. We, you know, the medicine does that, right? It just blasts you, <laughs> shakes you up a little bit. And uh, it's, um, it's helpful. I, I find it helpful in that way to just be a little off, not be, just be out of my cocoon you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're probably somebody that values those types of experiences and has had many of them as a I. And I think that what's going on collectively right now is like an intervention. You know, it's, a, it's, it's yeah, it's creating that disruption, this pattern that has obviously had some negative repercussions on our planet, yeah. on individuals, on society, and we're kind of taking cause from all that right now. The Earth is having a moment to breathe. Um, I think collectively, yeah. people are also having time to breathe. Also, you know, it's like we're withdrawn now from the constant hustle and the constant yes. simulation. Yeah, all the stuff that we're we're kind of like addicts to. You know, totally. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really seeing. Uh, there's a lot of friends that I found that were so addicted to their hustle and their, you know, career and using it as a way of not 
really dealing with the deeper stuff. And now they're actually provided an opportunity to look a little deeper, to, to maybe develop some creative process that was never nurtured, that they never gave themselves the time to do. And so there is, there's so many layers to it. It's so incredibly complex and so many ways to view it. And the earth, yeah. the, the renewing of the earth, I mean, that whole thing is just beautiful to see what's that's, happening. That's yeah. the interesting thing I, I think about what's going on. We're all kind of looking at the same thing, but there's so many different perspectives, so yeah. many different facets and lenses to be able to see what's going on. And people I've been talking to mostly similar perspective to the one that you have, that this is a time of uh, regeneration and intervention and that it's ultimately a positive thing. But I'm sure there's also plenty of people in the world who are just, that, that see this as something very, very bad and um, are filled with a lot of grief and anxiety as a result. Yeah. yeah. This is the, you know, what was, I think it was Ken Wilbur said, suffering is the first grace, you know. It's like this is the doorway to to starting to see, and um, it takes sometimes a tremendous amount of suffering to to get that. You know? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's something that that Ram Dass talks about too. He says that when you realize that suffering is grace, then it's it's almost like cheating, or sort of feel like you're cheating or, or something. Yeah, yeah. But you have to learn how to turn it you have to really be able to kind of get uh because it's tricky you know the mind wants to especially if you have trauma which everyone does um to a degree you're there's a story that um often gets associated with with the addiction to the pain and then we yes. just hold on to that versus utilizing it you know i mean like even eckhart tolle would say the pain body you know he would describe it as the pain body and addiction to the pain body and we get comfortable i've spent many years comfortable in some very dark crevices <laughs> just uh, spending time in the pain and getting very comfortable there you know really i think you you know it pretty well too just <laughs> just getting really cozy in, <laughs> in the suffering and actually like glorifying it as like, you know, it like becomes an art or something in a sense, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think you have to get there with it to know what to do with it. You have to get very intimate with it. You know? Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting to me because I, yeah, I have definitely gotten caught in those places at various times in my life. I've learned, you know, definitely before the development of my meditation practice was a lot more acute. But even now, sometimes where I get to places of, um, yeah, like like a kind of um, cementing of, of suffering, where it, it kind of crystallizes like a cocoon around me. And then something will happen that will shift that, like uh, perhaps um, a medicine journey or something <laughs> like that, that allows me to see outside yeah. of that and and see kind of that I was in a playground the whole time. And then I it just makes me ask myself like, what have I been doing? Like, you know, but why why it's like there's that entity that is the pain body yeah. that is really tenacious and just wants to cling and to hold oh, yeah. on. I and know. Why? Why does it do that? That that's a good question. It's like what it's you know what, I guess no, I mean, one of the views is, is that we're, um, this is the, this is the practice. This is part of, you know, human experience is that we're, you know, we're subject to these things at this, at this realm of existence, right? It's like a certain grossness of this realm that, um, that is just part of the mind, you know, the collective mind. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, I always, you know, I think that's where, like, when I was young and collecting Venosa postcards, you know, like, I literally would go to this esoteric bookstore by my mother's house called Agartha, and they sold these little, you know, I think it was Pomegranate Publishing that would publish those early books of his, and I would collect all his postcards, and it was like, you know, 
astral realms and these incredible other dimensions. And, um, and I, you know, I had those thoughts. I was like, I want to, I want to be in this world, you know, like why am I, cause this is all light and for, like they're in these ethereal dreamlike spaces. And, you know, I felt a deep connection to it and I thought, but there must be something there. You know what I mean? And it was one of those things where it's like, we just happen to be born <laughs> into this one right now. But maybe we were there in the last, you know, maybe our galactic cosmic connection now has something to do with a previous existence. You know, I'm sure it does. Um, I actually just learned that, you know, I learned this another level of it recently, which is this, um, I've been fascinated with Arcturus for a long time, the star system Arcturus. Mm -hmm. And my brother is a, is a Vedic astrologer. He does all kinds of Vedic stuff, but he, he sent me, he sends me updates on my chart all the time. He says, pay attention to this and this. And, and I kind of put some things together um, recently. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a, basically a, a, you're born into a certain star system essentially. And I actually found out that according to my astrology in Vedic astrology here, I was born in Arcturus. Like, so that's my chart is rooted in Arcturus in Vedic astrology in this life. And I thought, wow, cool. You know, like suddenly I put something, maybe there's the link and not to say I'm Arcturian, but you know what I mean? It's like interesting. My brother who has no interest in the extraterrestrial or any of that cosmic component other than the Vedic astrology is affirming this with no connection to what is going through my head. And I thought, this is so interesting. So again, there's so many layers to um, to why things are the way they are. And, you know, you think about, I don't know, I, I'm always fascinated. I think about like, for example, you know, Yogananda, when he was coming to the United States, um, he had no English. He just spoke Hindi. You know, he was coming, he was on a boat from like wherever in India to Boston. And his, his guru sent him here to teach. And he had no English. And he literally, like, accessed, you know, Akashic Records. I don't know what, but downloaded the English language on this what? boat trip. He gets yeah. to the U.S. and he's fluent. I mean, it sounds unreal. You know what I mean? But it's like all this information is available to us, these timelines, all this stuff is just kind of being, having that opening. Yeah, and access to it. And I think you're obviously your, your art, you know, as a painter, I mean, you're obviously accessing multiple timelines and realms and there's a lot going on there, you know? Yeah, I, th I think that there's so many different dimensions that we simultaneously, and even the idea of like past lives or, or future lives, yeah. or whatever, but maybe you, you do exist simultaneously in another reality. Or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Because, um, certainly through psychedelic experiences I've had, and not just psychedelic experiences, also through lucid dreaming and a lot of other things like that, but the um, I've had access to the experience of existing in two realities simultaneously. Mm. Yeah, like a reality that has its own consistency and logic to it that's distinct from this you know so in lucid dreaming i've visited particular realms that have incredible yeah. fidelity and realism to them that when i was there felt as real if not more real than this dimension that we're in now yes and then you wake up in your bed and you're back yeah here. yeah so i think it is possible that even I was thinking about this the other day, like the people, when they say you go to sleep, you're unconscious, like you're not actually unconscious. Right. Just your yeah. consciousness is shifting to a different dimension or, or a different yes. point. Yeah. You know, so I think we do exist or our consciousness exists simultaneously on yeah. all these different levels and all these different right. realms. And it's just that when, when we can cultivate the lucidity of our consciousness to be able to. Yeah. Well, it's like consciousness is non-local, right? I mean, that's the, so it's existing at all times, everywhere. You know, you can't locate it. You can, 
right? You can locate the brain, you can, the regions of the brain and all these things. And obviously like, but there is this thing about consciousness that is, is not, you can't, you can't do that with it. You can't do the science thing with it in a traditional sense. And so, yeah, there is a, it, it is working on multiple levels. And I think that's really what, what a good meditation practice does too. It opens you up to all these states and, you know, I mean, there's even in, in a lot of Buddhist practices, they have these, the gates, you know, that you can measure how far you've gone into these states of, of awareness and awakening. And they you literally enter different, like almost like portals, you know, it's almost like heightened states of consciousness. And in some ways, psychedelics, you know, hurl you into them, right? It's like, <laughs> you don't have a choice. It's like Terrence McKenna would call it the highway to God or something. I remember him saying that. Like, I saw Terrence McKenna speak when I was in high school. My mother took me to a reincarnation lecture at an auditorium, and actually Timothy Leary was there, and Terrence. And I remember hearing Terrence speak and him talking about DNT, you know, and it was like, who is this guy? I mean, he just blew my mind. I felt like you could just transcribe everything he was saying in real time and it was like a book you know he's just so articulate yeah. in his vocabulary but he you know he's i feel like we're just starting to get a lot of the things he was proposing with timelines and you know his unraveling of the I Ching. i mean that dude it's uh it was yeah he was really it's 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 good to be alive i mean it's one of those things where i feel grateful like when, I, when we have these conversations, it's just there's so much to learn as a student of life. You know, it's like, how can you ever be bored, really? I mean, it's, if you go beyond the mundane and do the interior research, you know, I mean, even thinking about someone like a Emily Dickinson, you know, a Western poet who never really left her home. She, like, lived in her father's home her whole life. But she saw the universe in a blade of grass, you know. She was able to kind of see everything in the smallest things because she was paying close attention to what was around her and it's uh it's to be able to live that way is is really that's the ticket you know it's it's heightened state of awareness in the moment and realizing everything's right here and mm -hmm. and these other dimensions could be right here you know like I, you know, I mean, we in the medicine, you notice that all the time, beings appearing. It's like, whoa, okay, you know, or with with uh, with DMT, it's like, yeah, that's uh, it's really um, that that stuff it gives me a lot of excitement. The you know the these unknowns and this search and the the research, you know, to go inward and to to, to really to wake up, <laughs> to wake up. You know, it's um. This is this is the the gig. <laughs> this is what I, I don't know. I I just get I, it excites me thinking about this stuff. You know. Yeah. No, I'm completely fascinated by it too, and I've been for many many years. Yeah. I mean, dude, I just I've been on this you know deep in the sacred geometry stuff recently again, kind of just going another level of it. Have you ever heard of this dude? And it makes me think of your 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 ink this newer piece that you got on your chest mm -hmm. this dude stan tenon have you heard of him he's like a scientist he basically like fascinating i'm how this guy isn't more known is incredible but he's out there and there's interviews with him and stuff and a lot of information but he basically like placed a 3d like tube torus like within a tetrahedron and like he he like like combined the structure and found that it produced like it was like the the shapes of the Hebrew alphabet was wow. like like literally within like a tube torus within a, a tetrahedron like looking down or something he saw all the geometry of the Hebrew alphabet and it was like he decoded the roots of ancient language you know and it was like you just, when you like, how, I'm like, how have I not heard about this dude, right? It's like, but these are the origins, like this is getting back into the origin, like, like this is where geometry, you know, gets the word sacred, right? Sacred geometry, it's like, it's, you know, and that language has, it's formed in geometry, you know, it's, 
It makes me think of that when I see, what does it say, the thing that you, is so it a this prayer? Was, yeah, it's a prayer. It's a Kabbalistic protection prayer for Jacob. So when I was in Amsterdam, there is an um, exhibit for the Kabbalah at the Jewish Historical Museum. And I went there and they had these tiny little hand inscribed pieces of paper that were like a thousand years old that were with these Hebrew characters and they were protection amulets. Mm. So rabbis would create them for, for specific people and then give them to them and they would carry it with them like their whole lives. But when I was there, I found one that was for Jacob. And I had this vision mm -hmm. for a long time of getting this like black or chest piece that was kind of like a protection for my heart, things like that. And when I found uh, that, I was like, oh man, I, I need to uh, have that. You know, and had it done ceremoniously in Thailand with this amazing um, Thai Buddhist uh, Sakyan tattoo artist, Majun Man, who did it with the, the bamboo. Wow. Uh, with a lot of prayer and attention. That was, yeah, really powerful. Yeah. Now I'm remembering, I remember you did a post about the origins of it. Now I remember reading about that because I remember Amsterdam in a museum or something. and. How cool. So when you saw it, you just was like, that's it kind of thing you recognized? Yeah. Well, what was really fascinating about it is that I had had a strong medicine journey a few days prior. And in that space, had these visions of Hebrew or Aramaic texts kind of arranged in sacred geometry. And it felt mm. sort of like looking at the source code, like as if I was seeing the, the cool. you know, heroes in one matrix yeah. or something like that. And it was beautiful. And when I went to this exhibition, maybe two or three days later, they had all these arrangements of Hebrew spells, essentially Kabbalistic Hebrew spells arranged mm. in geometric formations that looked exactly like what I saw. And wow. it, I was blown away by that. So you it was know, like so a premonition. Yeah, Maybe. it was like a premonition. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And when I went there and I, I found that one that was for Jacob, I just, yeah, I knew that was, that was That's the one. That's cool. I had to have <laughs> That's really and cool. I'm fascinated by uh, the Kabbalah and by the Hebrew alphabet and its correlation with the tarot and all of that stuff. Yeah, I'll send you some Stan stuff. So you, I'll, I'll turn you on to some of his. It's fascinating. Um, there's some interviews with him, too, where he talks about it. Um, you know, you're making me think of something. I remember uh, my father, when he lived on Miami Beach, he was like in a high rise in a kind of Jewishy neighborhood of, of Miami Beach, kind of um, more the mid, mid, like not South Beach, more up, further up. And um, I remember I one day just like I was staying at his place and I walked out to the beach and I found a, a yarmulke, you know, on the beach. And I, I can't read Hebrew, but I like it said, it says something on Hebrew on it. And I like took it, you know, I was like, oh, I found it on the beach, you know, so I, and I remember I like, don't know where I was, but somehow within a few days, I like put it on and wore it and was like around my dad's neighborhood and some girl that was in line somewhere just goes, Jakob. And I, <laughs> and I said, Oh, so she was saying, and it, so it was a, it, that was what it said. It said it was probably like a, you know, a bar mitzvah one or something with the, but I thought it was interesting, you know, so I'm just, I'm remembering that right now. I don't think I've ever told that story, but the <laughs> thing. so maybe that was my, you know, cause I've known you a long time, actually. We've, we've, you know, emailed been in correspondence for over a decade, probably. You know, right? Because I remember way back you emailing me. Um, and, um, but uh, anyways, I thought that was interesting. It's, it brought up the, the Jakob. And then I have another uh, Jacob in my life, a friend in New York who's an artist. He's a, he's a musician and a poet. And um, so it's a very powerful name. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good people. Yeah. You know, there's Jacob's Ladder. So uh, yeah. Jacob also to go into the the Hebrew meaning of the name. I think that Jacob, uh, you know, was the one that that created this ladder between heaven and earth. So Jacob yeah. is like the intermediary between the higher dimensions and 
I mean, yeah. at least there's a lot of different, you know, nuances to the story, but that's definitely the aspect of the story I resonate with the most. So yeah. I'll take that as that the meaning like of the day. That was like a movie too, wasn't it? I feel like I, there was a movie like in the, I don't know, I, now I can't remember, but I want to say there was a movie called Jacob's Ladder that was really cool. It might have been in like the 80s or 90s, but yeah, that's really cool. What time is it there? Uh, it's almost 11 a.m. Okay, wow. So you're way ahead. On on market? Yeah. Uh, or yeah. Oh, Monday. Okay. Yeah, so it's like Australia kind of. Kind of, right? yeah. I think that Australia is maybe like a few hours time difference, but otherwise, yeah. Nice, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much that I'd love to dive into about with you and your work and everything. I'm really curious because the juxtaposition of the fascination with consciousness and Buddhism and playing extreme metal music is kind of like a, it's a funny pairing. So I'm kind of curious how your path as a metal musician led you to Buddhism and meditation, psychedelics and, and all of this. Yeah. Um, well, there was definitely some conflict there at first because I felt like those two worlds didn't meet well, especially early on. It was like, wait, am I allowed to be into this and like write lyrics about these things, but make this really heavy extreme music? Like, is that okay? You know, I mean, I remember asking him and I just, but I, I was just trying to be in an authentic place with the creative process. And thankfully I had enough courage to pursue it, you know, and cause I did have people that were not okay with that around. And I was around a lot of very tough, especially there was a period there, a lot of heavy duty metal people, extreme that were just brutal, you know, and extreme, the extreme edges of, of that scene and um so felt very much like an outsider and isolated but i you know i i pers i went further down that road and i think it what happened was i had extreme angst and anger as a child i st i still do i've just learned how to work with the energy of anger differently um but it was uh it was really there you know a lot of rebellion a lot of I was pissed. I was, I didn't like authority. I still have issues with authority. I mean, there were some really, some core stuff going on there that got acted out. I got kicked out of schools and camps and I was a troublemaker, you know? And, um, and I, um, I like, you know, the visceral aggression of that music spoke to me as a, as a young musician, although I had classical roots and then, you know, I, my brother turned me on to classic rock and, you know, he was a Zeppelin Pink Floyd guy, which was a great foundation, but of course I had to go further, you know? And um, so for me, it just, that led to Slayer and Metallica and then just death metal, you know, it was like I'm just going as far. And interestingly enough, it was a time where I grew up, although we were outcasts in Southern Florida, Central Florida, you know, we were in like the city kids in Miami, but Central Florida had this, had this scene that was, you know, and there was a whole tape trading community. So, you know, I made a lot of friends with people in that community because um, I got into the underground and collecting, just getting hit. There were so many bands. I think it's still going on, actually. Um, but at the same time, because I had this new agey mother who was, taking me to astrologers and psychics since I was a child and like llamas and people that would talk to me and you know I mean <laughs> it's like so I was exposed to these two worlds and uh I had a genuine yearning for a spiritual yearning from an early age I was collecting Bonosa postcards but listening to you know deicide you know what I mean like it was a weird thing that was but I was, I was okay with it, you know what I mean? And it was really kind of coming to terms with that. I was going to embrace this, 
these two aspects. But I will say the early origins of even Cynic, I mean, were more punk and political. Like I had a very thrashy punk anti-establishment approach to lyrics. And that was really the high school days, you know? It was just like, fuck society, fuck the system. I mean, I'm still that way to a degree as a conspiracy theorist, but, but um, I was more connected to it in terms of uh, language as an art form, you know? And then it got, but I started, as I got deeper into meditation practice and really doing the work internally, I found that there was another way. And, and I found that actually it was much more rich to get into this spiritual stuff and, and have that contrast with this extreme music. By the way, is it getting too dark in here? Because I could turn a light on, or is it fine? It's fine. I think it's okay for that, yeah. Okay, cool. Because I see myself, but I'm very much in the dark, but my screen might be dim too. It's atmospheric. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, yeah, it's one of those things where I I really did um, had to kind of come to terms with this reality that I was deeply interested in, in a spiritual path and the reality of wanting to wake up. I mean, I literally had a moment there, like at probably my senior year of high school, um, where I was like, do I become a monk? Do I, you know, am I like going to go and go into a monastery and like maybe I'll be like the music guy and just like, but I just wanted to give my life to the path, you know? And and that contrast with, you know, like Chuck Schuldiner saying, hey, will you come on tour with me? And, you know, so I'm like playing with death. <laughs> I wanted to like be a monk, you know what I mean? It was like, it's weird. <laughs> And it was so, um, it was it was difficult for a long time, you know. And then I think Cynic kind of came into really with focus. It was like it finally, there was some adhesion there. And I found a language where those two worlds could meet and actually coexist and beautifully coexist. And that you can hold this really beautiful kind of ethereal cosmic, yearning to awaken space and spiritual language with really visceral extreme art and it's okay they can they can come you know so it was a it was really yeah i'm still on that journey yeah you know i mean it's like you never you never arrive it's not like there's some point of a right it's like an ongoing situation but um it was really for me I, uh, for a while there, there was definitely going through the, the woods and getting cut by thorns and and figuring out what which how where what is this path and what am I doing and at ag against all odds really because you know in, in the scene that we were in the extreme scene people were not cool with that <laughs> you know it's like how dare you wear Indian silk robes and you know but you. <laughs> You know, you're, you're, you've got this brutal stuff happening. It's like, what the hell is going on here? And I'm, I'm actually really, I, I think psychedelics gave me permission. We were doing a lot of LSD. I was selling LSD in high school. And I was journeying a lot alone. And, you know, just going into these spaces. And so it was like a, all that internal quest stuff gave me a lot of courage you know, because you're just used to going into the unknown. When you do medicine, you're just hurled into the unknown and you've got to work with it. You're just, there's no, you know what I mean? It's like, here we are. And so in some ways it really paralleled the, the creative path of just, of like being in this unknown and being okay with it and, and having enough like acceptance, you know, accepting oneself, saying it's okay to be, an outcast, to be a rebel, to not fit in with everybody. Um, you know, also coming terms with my sexuality. You know, I mean, there was just a lot of complex stuff, stuff happening there. And I had to work with it. <laughs> you know, again, I'm still working with it. But it was really, uh, it was quite a, quite a time. You know, you're bringing me back. I'm really kind of stepping into it. I haven't really thought about this in a long time. So it's, it's good to to go, get in there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing Cynic perform with um, Sugar 
in San Francisco, maybe in like 2008 or 2009 or something. Yeah, 2008, I think. Yeah, but that was also when I was starting to make my very first forays in meditation. Yeah. Like that because my father was interested in Buddhism, and you know, I'd go with him to see Jack Hornfield, that Spirit Rock, yeah. and stuff like that. But I uh, was very much into extreme metal, black metal, stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah, like I feel like Cynic's music was kind of like this this bridge for me also. You know, and I, the tool also, you know, yeah. the lyrics of tool and stuff, yeah. it exposed me to a lot of concepts, but cynic as well. And I remember at that time you were posting these blog posts where you'd have a photograph of your meditation bench yeah. at, in like the parking lot of the, yeah. the different metal venues. Yeah. Uh, and I loved fun. that. I thought yeah. that was so cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That and was I think fun. it's okay to, it's okay to reconcile these uh, apparent polarities within ourselves you know Ooh, i still yeah. listen to metal and i still enjoy it but i still you know meditate and i get real shanty sometimes too <laughs> it's that's it yeah and i've seen you do some writing about this and posts and i appreciate i really connect with what you're what you're talking about because it's true it's like we we all have these inherent polarities and and you know people that's the thing you know, like, I feel like the regular world, you know, the nine to five, like people that live in a, they're probably in, in many ways, they, they have more extreme, like they're, they have the shadows aren't as developed. So they get shoved under and they manifest as these heightened states of neuroses, you know, I mean, it can be really sick stuff that you don't work through. And thankfully, you know, I feel like I've been given these vehicles to kind of process a lot of stuff. And it's, it's actually been really cathartic because it's helped me accept these, these two seeming disparate, but it's really like we're humans, you know, we embrace all of it. I mean, down to the reality of how we were born. I mean, it's, and how we die. I mean, the, the, I don't know who it was that said this. It's like, I, this is why I also am fascinated with the rainbow body, you know, the Tibetan death technique. It's, uh, you know, where you, they learn how to dissolve the body. It's like a beautiful death, essentially. And it's, it's almost like the, the highest state of the Tibetan Book of the Dead practices. You know, it's like a fully conscious exit and doing it where you dissolve the body and you, but like you, I sit there and I think about, the reality is most of our deaths will be really grotesque. The body will rot. It's, it's not pretty. It's not cute at all. You know, death is really kind of gnarly. And it, but it's part of our existence. It's part of what happens in this form. And to really accept that is, it's, that's the thing. It's like to look at all of this and accept it and to embrace it and to find a way to make poetry with to make art with it it's uh this is this is the gig for i mean I, I i'm that's where i'm coming to it's like to say it all and to be okay with it all you know mm -hmm. all the ugliness all the beauty yeah. and not judge ourselves to really have that compassion and gentleness to to be to hold all of it and you know i mean that's one of the the lessons i keep getting is to just be you know i think that was the first thing that happened with me in my when i first early stages of working with the medicine was realizing how hard i was on myself and that happened with therapy as well i was just beating myself up for so many years not good enough not you know and it pushed me in many ways to become a better musician you know essentially but it was done in a very destructive way you know so the, the gentleness aspect is, is, is key now, at least as I've matured. It's like, oh, it's, yeah, you don't have to beat yourself up <laughs> in this way. Yeah. yeah, I resonate with that too. I think it comes from the culture that I grew up in. You know, and I, I grew up in Marin County, which is a pretty high achieving place. So there's a lot of pressure to be this thing. So I was really hard on myself too when I was younger and uh, yeah. working in a school system where everybody was really hard on themselves and teachers and parents were all really hard on the kids too to push them to be this mm. thing. And yeah, there was a lot of uh, deep programming 
that I had to go through, and uh, medicines helped that a lot. Yeah. Are still helping that. Wow. You know? Yeah. Because I don't think it's a complete process. But to bring it back to something you said about um, embracing our natures, whether they're beautiful or ugly, I was listening to this podcast with Eric Davis. Do you, are you familiar with his work? Not, no, I know the name, but I... I think you'd really appreciate his work. He's a kind of psychedelic philosopher, you know, but contemporary, uh, has written some interesting books, but is a gifted speaker. But he was talking about, I guess, I guess the, the subject got provoked through uh, the correlation between the word pandemic and pan, like pantheism, oh. or whatever. But he was talking about pantheism and, and nature worship and showing how nature can be a really horrific, vicious thing. Yeah. You know, how yeah. like, you know, wasps will like inject their eggs with caterpillars and then like they explode and eat the caterpillars. Yeah. Like, well, that's nature, right? Right. And so if you're going to be a, a nature worshiper, it's not just like worshiping the butterflies and like, right. hugging the trees. It's to really embrace nature for yeah. what it is, but it's also horrific and ferocious and yes. grotesque. Yes, you know, and yes. I think that coming to a true acceptance of ourselves also as being in this human experience and human body is to also reconcile that we have all the natures within ourselves. Yes. You know, that we are we are gentle and we are compassionate and altruistic and all these noble, beautiful qualities, but there there's also the shadow yes. of humankind, which we also have to respect or at least hold in some form of reverence and to appreciate it yeah. as essential to our our being and the strange polarities that we exist in. Yes. It's the shadow. It's uh Robert Johnson, I don't know if you know him, he was a kind of Jungian analyst, author, guy who analyzed um Greek myths. And um, he he has a book called Embracing the Shadow. Like he was famous for a, a couple books called We, three books, We, He, and She, which was like embracing masculine psychology, feminine psychology, and then romantic kind of love. And he would take like these myths and do a modern Jungian kind of interpretation of them, Jung. And, um, but uh, he had this one little book called I think embracing your shadow or your own shadow. And um, it was, uh, for me, when I read that, it was really one of the first times I saw that conversation come up, like, you know, that we, we're all working with it. It's just a question of how closely you want to look. How, how, how willing are you to look at these aspects of your psyche and to meet them and to, and to, to be okay with what's going on, you know, to integrate actually, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, this is, this is the work as a human being, I think, right. It's to get, to work with the psyche, to work with the, the collective unconscious and, and these shadows. And right now, I mean, especially the time we're in, there's so much collective shadowing and projections going on. And, and I see it more than ever, like people just, puking their neuroses onto other people and I catch myself doing it sometimes and I'll nip it in the butt if I can where it's just like oh wait no you know you just that didn't land right <laughs> you know you you gotta retract or catch you know um but it and oftentimes you know it's like the Ram Das, you, you know one of his most famous quotes it's like you think you're enlightened go hang out with your family it's like it's you know it's that's where it all comes to the surface all that all that collective shadow work and um so it's a great place to work it's a great place to to do the stuff you know to look yeah yeah so we're we're coming down to the wire for this uh, hour because the instagram live is limited okay to an hour. do you want to still talk for a bit more or do you have to run yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to probably split probably pretty soon, but yeah, I'll talk a little more. I'm, you know, where I'm going tonight after we hang up, I'm going to go check out the bioluminescence. Have you heard about that? It's so oh. California's coast, Southern California has bioluminescence right now.
like they call it red uh what it, it's like it's like a plankton thing but the literally it's like this luminescent electric blue water and you wow. it's, all, it's unbelievable and all these friends have been going it's all the way from like now it's actually up to actually i was hearing it was in santa monica last night but it's down more san diego and so i just want to get in that water i want to find a secret spot a buddy of mine's going to pick me up and we're going to go check that out man. <laughs> i just i want to cool. see it you know um a, a bunch of friends have been going they said it's just absolutely magical um wow. it's a rare thing it doesn't happen very often so it's like a red tide or something i think it's the term amazing yeah yeah well why don't i end this and then i'll i'll go live again and we can chat for just a little bit more sure okay uh, you are a little dark so maybe okay i'll light it up all right yeah let me see cool all right so i'm gonna hang this up i'll i'll go okay. live again in a second i'll see you real cool. soon okay is that better hold on yeah that looks great you know it's it's my um i gave a light to a buddy of mine who moved into the building that kind of was one of my main living room lights so it's kind of been darker in here lately but i like it <laughs> speaking no, of the I, shadow i love oh. the atmosphere of your home with like the red walls and the the warm dim lights it's so like cozy yeah yeah i actually flipped the living room since you were here i've kind of like turned everything so you're facing the wall now from the couch and oh, nice. it's um yeah, it works. It kind of opened things up. Um, I've been moving things around, and I, I have some art to frame, including some of your pieces. And oh, great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's nice to move move things around and kind of move the energy in the home, right? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, there's a number of things I'd love to talk to you about. I was really inspired by the post you made recently about this project that you and your ex-partner did with uh, the the boards to yeah. help people in the hospitals and i was also really interested in hearing more about your hospice work mm -hmm. if you're if you're open to talking about that and sure. i just thought that that was such a yeah such a a, a beautiful expression of altruism you know uh and and a really um good example that we can make a difference if we use a bit of energy uh, towards the greater good. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have never been very open about it um, because it's just felt so private and quiet and you just want to maintain dignity with the people you work with and stuff and so and i just you know so it's been definitely a, a delicate transition for me to kind of enter into because i brought it up here and there historically and i think actually somebody added it a long time ago to a wikipedia like someone i met or and i had conversations with people in the scene here and there but it was never a public thing and so yeah, I was in a relationship. Um, I had a boyfriend, we were together for five years. Um, and we had a really interesting, you know, where he's one of my dearest friends to this day, like he's a real soul brother, and um, deep, deep trust. Um, and um, we had a very creative relationship. We were always kind of, he always wanted to be partake in songs I was writing and whatnot. And he was, but he was a natural medical person. Like he worked as a nurse when we were together, but eventually he continued his education. And now he's, you know, like the head of, he's a pediatric anesthesiologist. I mean, he literally went to like medical school for like 20 years. <laughs> it's like wow. a specialty of a specialty, you know, you're putting babies to sleep, you know? Um, and so he spent his whole life basically in hospitals and all this. And I had already a background before I knew him in Miami. I started to do uh, volunteer work. I remember just it was one of those things, some spiritual teacher that I was into somewhere, you know, I, I, you know, I was, it was a combination of things, wanting to be a karma yogi, to be of service somehow. I didn't know how to do it. And I thought, well, 
I'm terrified of, of, of death. And I know of this organization that um, it needs help with volunteers. It was called the Men's Health Crisis in Miami. And this was kind of AIDS era, you know, like it's still the AIDS era, but it was the peak of like one of the peaks, you know, early mid nineties. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in the, one of the basically ground zero of it because a lot of the, the men, especially gay men in New York were coming to Miami to die. Um, they were coming to Miami beach to die because it was warm and the weather was, so it was like, and it was really weird because I remember an influx of Northeastern people. I mean, that was that tourism was always there, but, uh, but you suddenly Miami South beach, especially became this like, almost like a gay ghetto, you know, I mean, a cool gay ghetto it was awesome. But it was what I learned later that it was it was guys coming there to die. It was just a whole population of people. And so I ended up um, my first patient was a, a dude whose name was Emmanuel Rivera. And um, he um, he he uh, we got very close and um, I was so inspired. I was so lucky to get to get into that work at first I was so scared, but to meet somebody who was so open and so courageous and, um, and just looking at everything head on. And um, he brought me right in, you know what I mean? And it was, I was, I knew once I like, you know, after that journey ended with him, I, um, I knew I was gonna be doing this for the rest of my life. It felt like the most important thing I could be doing although I had a path as, as a musician, I was like, this is, this is the most meaningful stuff I've ever done. Really, it just felt like, cause it has nothing to do with you yet in some ways, it's everything to do with you because you're confronting your own terror of death. You're having to go walk side by side with somebody who's entering into that space and having to, you know, so I got into Elizabeth Kubler Ross, you know, I don't know if you know, she wrote a book called on death and dying. She's a, she's the, she's one of my heroes. Um, and she, um, she basically, uh, you know, like Stephen Levine, you know, Stephen Levine, Noah's mm -hmm. father. So like, Stephen Levine connected with Elizabeth Kubler Ross back in the day, and he kind of brought the Buddhist stuff into her work. Um, but um, with, like his Deben was very a death and dying guy. So they kind of merged in, in many ways. And Ram Das has a big background with this as well. Right. Yeah, he did a lot of hospice work. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, it's again, this like desire to enter into, you know, to go into the terror and um, get intimate with it. And at the same time, be of service and help show up for people in a way. And for me, it just felt like meaningful. It just felt like, wow, this is, this is good. This is, and I felt natural. I, I actually came into a place where I was like, I think I'm actually good at this. I'm good at being, meeting people in a very, you know, in, with, their, with their fear and terror and just holding space. Like it, it was very natural for me. Um, so yeah, I ended up moving to LA after doing, having that patient in Miami, Cynic broke up essentially. This was around the portal period. So it was like 94, 95. And I moved to LA and, um, I, he, Lance was my first boyfriend here. And, um, just immediately I told him I, I've been doing volunteer work working with dying people. And he's like, come to the hospital. He was already working at UCLA. And he brought me in to work with at the first, at first it was these infants um, from Bakersfield that were, had leukemia. And it was heartbreaking. Um, you know, Bakersfield has a nuclear power plant and like, apparently it was like in the fucking water. These babies were being born with leukemia from the environment they were the city they were born in. I don't know if that's still a thing, but it was a whole Bakersfield sick children wave going on at that time and UCLA had had a lot of them and I literally would just go from one baby to another some of them were like you know crack babies with addicted mothers that the moms were gone so they're just basically you know, left in hospitals but these little you know these infants are grabbing your your finger right 
And you can't help but have your heart ripped open when you're around a child, a, you know, a, a parentless child, an infant, or an infant that has cancer and, you know, doesn't even know the nature of the suffering that they're in, in, been born into. And they're, they're extending, you know, they're reaching out for your support. It's just rips me open in a way that I, I want to be ripped open. I want to touch that. I want to touch, you know, it's, uh, that makes me feel connected to being alive. It makes me feel my humanity and, and it's a reminder of our impermanence and how we're all connected. I mean, all these things come up in those environments, but, uh, so we ended up, so that was the beginning of the stuff. I started to work with these leukemia kids and just basically holding space with little children and playing little pieces of music and just trying to bring ease to a suffering child. And then, and then we, I got into transplant patients and uh, which was like full blown adults who were having, you know, l entire organs replaced. And a lot of them didn't make it, you know, it's a dip, it's a tricky thing. I think we're a lot further along now than we were then. This was the night, you know, early mid nineties. But um, yeah. And uh, I just had that one patient who basically uh, this opera singer lady, Joan, who, beautiful woman um who i did uh, spend a lot of time with and got very close to i cared so much about her and um and she uh and, and you know the story goes i basically was trying to communicate with her and she was fully intubated and i remember i mean to this day i can watch her lips move and it would just be like it's like a broken whisper i mean she could barely She's like, you know, it's just, it's a mess. You know what I mean? Literally, it's a, it's a very difficult environment physically to be in. Um, and I, um, I wanted to communicate with her. And I remember asking a respiratory therapist for, uh, to try and get, you know, I said, could you, do you have something? And he hands me a photocopied sheet of the alphabet, literally like an eight and a half sheet of paper with like block A, B, C, D. And I was like, this is, are you kidding me? Like she's trying to spell like, I want water, you know, but it just like took 10 minutes, you know? And I remember going back to Lance that night and just going, man, I was with Joan today and this dude gives me a, piece of paper to communicate i was like this is all wrong you know and and then he you know he goes back in the next day and he has a flash he had a, he saw them struggling with her to communicate he has a flash and he calls me and he's like i got it you know and, and it was like we kind of it's like we both had this merging it was a, that was our relationship it was this creative and uh and by that night i made the first board you know and it was we were of course we were ambitious too so we're like we're gonna patent it and become millionaires <laughs> i mean there was this like altruistic thing that was genuinely but it was also like it's gonna make us rich and we'll never have to work so i mean i'm being really honest i mean it was that was so it was but i think at the root of it um was you know it was really rooted in in trying to help somebody and the reality is is that as i i as a musician and he is a medical professional professional there was no like the business side was this animal that was just overwhelming and impossible for us but at the end of the day we developed this thing that worked and that that's all that matters and so he reached out to me recently in the wake of COVID, and he said dude like he was like this is the only time ever that intubation is a thing publicly. It's like, it's never been a thing. It's the, it's your aunt that got intubated or, or something. You know what I mean? It's not a common, it's a rare, you know, I mean, maybe it's fairly common, but not as common as you might think. So it was like a public conversation. People can't breathe. Part of this disease process with the virus was suffocation. Right. And he's like, and, and, and he's like, I'm overwhelmed. I've, I've spent so all of my money providing boards. We're donating them. 
And um, I don't know what to do, you know? And I said, I'm going to do my part, you know, because I'm still connected to him. And anyways, okay. it's, um, it's always been, it's one of those things where I think, um, yeah, it's a beautiful invention. And, you know, I think what we came to realize that the trappings and the corruption within the medical industry to get something into a, a hospital is not, it's not because you have an incredible device that's functional and works. Like we did all this, the research studies, he did everything. Like we did everything to prove that it's necessary and functional and it still didn't matter. Like hospitals don't care. It's a business with the hospitals. They don't really have the patient's welfare in mind. It's about money and they overbill for everything. You know, it's a corrupt industry like everything else, unfortunately. But at the end of the day, like I still, you know, in my heart of hearts feel like this, this little thing, you know, especially now that it's an app. So there's like an application version of it, but there is something about the physical version that is different and the tactile nature of it that still is more functional than the iPad, that it, it really has a greater purpose. And I just, you know, I'm glad what we created it because even to this day, it's like, it's, you know, there's, a, I think, over a thousand hospitals or more that are using it. And, and I haven't been hearing as much because I'm not connected to the company anymore. But, you know, I get reports from Lance that it's all the time, these beautiful messages, you know, um, and um, that, you know, of, of people reporting back on how it's helping them. And at the end of the day, it's like, we're all trying to help each other out somehow. And I feel like that's what I'm doing with the music as well. It's like provide something. And I feel like the more honest you are with your art, it's not about being a teacher or saying, I know the answer. It's more just like being more real with who you are. And that in itself will do the work. It's just being more connected to something that's more genuine and authentic. Um, but that that thing, yeah, I'm I've, I'm proud of it, you know, and I'm glad I went public with it because it really came from a very earnest, beautiful place, and um, and it's it it works. It's it's not some invention that's just out there as a trick to make money. You know what I mean? It actually really works, and um, and I I'm grateful that we, you know, that we have it out there, and hopefully, I appreciate you asking about it because I really hope it it uh it finds its way you know and and, and reaches more people because it really should it's it's a special thing yeah um, i just thought it was really inspiring you know and my version of being of service in this time has been doing these podcasts you know trying to uh, communicate a message to people that is hopefully soothing to some degree or useful uh, but that was like next level that was yeah. actually doing something that was practically in service of people in these times. And I just, I thought that was really uh, inspiring. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it was, uh, it, you know, un unfortunate circumstances in which it had to surface. But again, this is how the universe works, right? You never know the time for anything to, that it, for it to appear. But this was, this was the time for it to appear. And I do think we, we got, you know, the response has been incredible, you know, based on that. I mean, even some news sites picked up what I did and I'm still behind the scenes trying to do a lot. We have some things going on because um, it really, it should be out there and it should be integrated into hospitals and be this thing that's normalized. And it's, again, it's the, the realities is, is that that's a business thing or you need someone like, you know, an Oprah to, endorse it and just be like bam you know what i mean like how she'll get behind an author or something and suddenly their book's a bestseller it's like you you need that level of exposure but at the end of the day even if it's helping one person it's done its job you know that's how i see it it's like i mean it'd be wonderful if it reached more people and it, it will but uh it, it really it's already doing its its job and it'll it'll find its way i do believe that that its intentions it's so pure-hearted that it'll it will find its way um yeah and i'm still doing the volunteer work you know i haven't stopped it's it's been the thing for me 
Um, like actually, you know, people ask about carbon based anatomy all the time. Like that whole record is that cynic record is, is, is ayahuasca and one of my patients that whole, it's like a death journey, you know, um, with somebody I took care of and doing a lot of medicine during that time. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, you know, it's like, maybe that's the theme of our talk is <laughs> going into the shadow and meeting, meeting these crevices and befriending these aspects of ourselves and holding them with compassion. And yeah, well, I think gentle. that, um, I think that in Western culture, we live disconnected from the cycles of life and death, which is very different than here in Bali. You know, you see people parade uh, down the streets carrying bodies all the time. And they're very yeah. intimate in the process of death and dying and rebirth. Their whole spirituality and religious beliefs are around staying connected to and appeasing ancestors and spirits. Mm. So they're, they're really in it. But I think that there is a false sense of security that people in the Western world have mm -hmm. uh, that makes people believe that they have some kind of invincibility or something yes. like that. Yeah. This whole situation has provoked a much greater prevalence of the conversation around death. I, I think people are thinking about it more and having to reckon with that. People yeah. Have, you know, for me, it's like, and I'm sure for you, it's the same. I've always gone there. You know, I've always I thought know. about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I remember even in high school, like being kind of fascinated with death and, and dying and I was into you know metal music and stuff like that but I just think that it is useful to actually go there and to allow yourself to think about those kinds of things which is also one of the essential meditation practices of yeah Buddhism. You know, it is are, or, or yeah like the death but practices. so many people don't so yeah many people don't allow themselves to think about that because it scares them I know and, uh, now yeah. you can't really help it I know. Yeah, it's that's one of the one of the positive aspects that it's it's bringing it to the forefront and it's really a very real thing and yeah, I mean I feel like my whole life is a preparation for it essentially. It's like, you know, it's like that's although you want to live completely while you're alive, it's I mean that's the end of the road in this form at at, at this time, but it is a big deal, <laughs> you know. And um I want a I want a front row seat, you know, when it <laughs> I really want to go in there fully fully awake, you know, I want to do it right, you know. I mean, I feel like that's like the more I I have a friend that I, I communicate with a lot about Buddhist practices and we get into all this stuff and we were getting into the rainbow body stuff and it was like I feel like that is some of the most important practices, but what's interesting is Somebody was talking about this recently that those used to be the sacred, um, like secret teachings, the death practices that were only given to the advanced students and people who had, you know, it was like you get access to it. It wasn't for everybody. But now it's kind of become this free for all where really advanced teachings are just kind of offered to. And, um, and, there is something to be said about building these foundations, you know, because I mean, arguably you could say this about even medicine work because there are a lot of traditional hardcore meditating people. And this includes my brother that would say you're risking blowing out chakras when you ingest medicine like that. If you haven't done the preparation, if you haven't worked with, the energy up and down your the spine, kundalini and all that. If you don't work with that and you have some loose screws or things, you know, mental, you can really blow out some shit. And um, so you have to be careful. That's why I'm not always saying, hey, everyone take the medicine. You know, it's like you got to kind of have done some work and been familiar with some things and ease into it. And it's not necessarily for everybody. And that is a, an important point to make, you know, because um it does hurl you into states that you might not be ready for. And um, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, for the most part, even the most horrific journeys seem to come back as a tremendous healing. I mean, 
you know, the darkest, like it and doesn't, it always that, ends well. <laughs> yes, it, but. I agree completely. I think that um, even some horrifying experiences that I've had have been really healing and have at least opened me up. But I think that that also has to do with my orientation that probably has to do with your orientation too. Yeah. I seem to have one of these kinds of minds or brains yeah. that like no matter how much you detonate it, it like comes back <laughs> online the next yeah. day, no problem. But some people don't have that, you know? Right. Some people like it, it blows their mind and their mind yeah. you know, ends up being scattered into a bunch of little pieces. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I guess in a way I was kind of, primed to do the kind of work that I do, you know, like required for it, but not everybody yeah. is. And I not everybody that. is. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, like, I remember certain yogic practices doing them, even with my brother and stuff, he would do these pranayam. Like, you know, there's a big Kundalini movement now. And yeah. it's, you know, all that breath work stuff. It's like, what I, I found, at least with a lot of the teachers that I've gone to, um, they're touching into the aspect of the breath work that gets you high essentially and right. you can have a little bit of a peek into that state but it's not the deeper you know what i mean it's but it's enough to get you addicted to it and to kind of tease into it where it's like magical and you feel the buzz but it's really like the preliminary stage of pranayam and it's it's you're not supposed to get attached to that it's like you know it's those heightened states of meditation where you start to access like i've had meditation retreats where it was like i felt like i took a hit of acid you know in a long sit and full on like opening you know and it's like that's not yeah it's okay you know keep going it's like don't get because people will just get caught up on that trip you know and they just hang out there Right. And, yeah, that's um, something that Ramdas talks about a lot, and I appreciate that about his teachings. Is that it's not about getting high. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm in a spiritual community here that loves getting high, yeah. and everything's <laughs> about getting high. Whether yeah. it's doing yoga or eating certain kinds of food that make you feel good. Yeah. Or being in beautiful environments, and the thing is, with any high, you come down. It doesn't matter. Yes. Like, you always come down. Yeah. And that always sucks. You know. Yeah. So. I guess then the practice becomes oriented towards liberating yourself from the identification uh, with the experiencer because yes. when there's separation between experience and experiencer, then there's always those highs and lows that you're subject to. Right. Whereas when the experiencer dies and there's only the experience, yes. then, then you know there's just the awareness which is constantly stable. That's it. And that place is like full of magic and wonder and it's really rich. If you can hang out there, it's all there. <laughs> you know, it's the trick is being able to stay there, you know, stay, stay there um, and not go down those, those th rabbit holes of stories and thoughts and all that, you know, we did that pull us out of, of the present, you know, it's, um, but it's, you know, I, what I was, my point with that mentioning the pranayama stuff is I remember, like, I think it was one of these classes my brother was doing. This was a while back. And there was a, you know, a girl there that was probably highly empathic, very sensitive. She was younger. And she literally, like, broke down to another level. Like, I cried in, Kundal you know, in the Kundalini classes. Like, you can, it just accesses knots and stored energy that's blocked. And, but I saw her go to a level that was like, is she going to be okay? You know what I mean? And it was, but it cracked open something. And, and it's like, those things are accessible to us in different ways. You know, it's not necessarily like, you don't necessarily need the medicine, you know, to, you just have to learn. And, and that's the thing is learning your own disposition and physiology, how you react to things. Some people just get, you know what I mean? It just takes one little of this to just, bam it's wide open you know others it's it's takes a you know three three ten hits of ass to get any you know what i mean everyone's yeah. different it's um so it's learning your own constitution essentially and how you engage and interact with this stuff and it's 
variety, you know, the varieties of blockages we have and traumas, stored traumas that we're undoing and layers of stuff that's just everyone's unique and that we all have our own imprint, you know, so there's no one right way to access this stuff. No. Yeah. Yeah, and there's so many different methods. Meditation. But me or meditation is, that I think, the, co the key foundation. You know what I mean? It's like, I always say that to if a friend's like going through it, you know, or in having a difficult time, are you sitting? Are you meditating? Because just silence, you know, to just be in silence, to not, like silence is always there, but we're avoiding it as much as possible. We're, we're, we're chasing noise, we're distraction, we're externalizing our experience, but this thing exists that silence and you can access it at any time it doesn't charge anything it's like like you're, you know you're back to the cornfield thing of people paying thousands of dollars to access you know spirit rock to sit and stuff. Yeah. but it's it's kind of always available to us and it's like that's that's really the thing is to be with when you can kind of sit in that it just and long enough it it does it it does itself it basically just you just have to learn this is the training you know is being able to kind of be in it's the hardest work you'll ever do <laughs> really you know yeah and it's elusive too because i find in my meditation practice sometimes it's so accessible like sometimes you can just drop in and it's so deep and you're so clear and stable and it's oh yeah you know but then other times it's like just so much restlessness and you sit down and five minutes later, you're like, I gotta get I gotta get up. I can't do this. You know, and I don't yeah. know why it's like that necessarily. But that's just the ebb and flow. It's the mind. Here. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I've had these like retreats where I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna, you know, go to the next level and stuff. And I swear, like, seven of the 12 days or you know were just like hell like i was just a mess <laughs> i couldn't and then there's ones where you're in this incredible like there's a lot of stability you get better at stabilizing your mind with practice like anything else but it um it's i do i think even the most advanced meditators still have those days you know where the the waves you know erupt and things get busier or just it's not as stable and you have to kind of find a way to work with it i mean that's the practice you know it's it's uh it's part part of the work do you think that your meditation practice has been a primary influence for your music and has helped you oh yeah to, you know more definitely concentration yeah it's a cornerstone um for everything i feel like all my best ideas have come through silence and um and, you know, I'm, I've even recently gotten back into this where I'll, you know, because I have like a certain type of practice I keep up, but I have moments of practice, especially um, the second half of the day when I do a practice where I will keep a journal in front of me and I will write down nuggets of flashes that are appearing, you know, in the meditation because you know otherwise i'm moving on or whatever but it's just kind of taking note of something and those things have been the roots of incredible creative pieces songs record ideas it's like they're like seeds that i feel like you're accessing from some field because they're not they don't feel like they're yours you know it's like you're just downloading some intel and bam there it is Whoa you know and then eventually it comes together and it formulates into some kind of work but um yeah i feel like it's a it's like you're accessing some greater field and opportunity to kind of tap into the the collective and um it's uh it's wonderful that it's always that bank is available it's like a data you know the rich field of energy that's always at our disposal we just have to stop moving you know it's uh you know, Noah tells that, Noah line, I remember, he was the first person I heard tell this story about in the time of like Mila Repa or something, there was a, that serial killer, there was a serial killer going around, like, I think he was literally like beheading people or a cannibal or something. I mean, it was just like, motherfucker was killing people hardcore in this village. And he encountered Mila Repa at some point. And I think it was, I mean, maybe it was even the Buddha, but I think it was Mila Repa in a field or something. And and 
Mila Rebel looked at him and just said, when are you going to stop? Like it was some kind of like, just stop. And it was this like, he had this bam, you know, full on it all. But it was like, he was running around just, you know, like, like crazy people, like everyone's been pre this situation we're in now. And he, he just had to stop. <laughs> and he, apparently he did. I mean, apparently actually what's funny is that I'm telling the story of Mila Repa. Mila Repa was a serial killer, right? right? Yeah, that was Mila Repa, right? Yeah, and he, and then his, I guess, it, like, and so, but he, I don't even know if he encountered the Buddha himself, but some teacher, and then to burn all that karma, he had to, like, build a house and destroy it a bunch of times, like, it was... I think his teacher was Marpa, but I'm It not was sure. Marpa, that's right. But yeah, Marpa was yeah. crazy. Yeah, and it was, like, he physical labor, yeah. Like, and I found it interesting, like the, the assignment, the early stage of burning the karma was literally like breaking your back, like building st structures and destroying them. And like, he just had so much gnarly karma to burn, you know? I mean, maybe there's a metaphor there, I'm sure. But um, yeah, there was, there's another, there's a few of those out there, this like serial killer just stopping, you know, it's like, and I, again, it's that, that's meditation. It's like, when are you going to stop and just sit? And I used to say that to a friend when we were deep into like intellectualizing spiritual study, like before I was really properly sitting, I was reading a lot of it and I would just, it was a way of working with my own stuff. You know, like I would intellectualize my pain. I still do it to a degree as a being in therapy since I was a child. And, um, and I remember like, we would just say, when are we going to fucking just really just start sitting? Cause we're just, we're just like jerking off here. You know, we're just talking about it all the time, but when are you going to actually do the work? And then I finally turned that corner where we did, you know, but now I've got my friends saying, when are we going to really go for it? Like go do a year retreat or something. You know what I mean? Like shut it mm -hmm. down for real, not do this, like, you know, in the world, you know, like you're you're you have your job and you're you're maintaining like when are you gonna really go for it like I, those aspirations are lurking you know it's uh it may happen at some point you know well in india they have this kind of process where you establish your kind of home and business and you have a family and then in the later stages of your life yes. then you renounce that and then you you go full force into this right so yeah. maybe it's just not quite the time yeah maybe yeah. you'll do that later in your life yeah it's true actually it's it actually sounds really appealing like in like 70s or something or 80s like you just go for it you know and and a lot of those advanced especially in the buddhist path those elder teachers they spend most of their time in retreat um you know and then they come out and share some insights and then go back it's kind of cool you know i love that <laughs> yeah there's a few questions let's check these out okay yeah maybe we can wrap it up after this too because sure. my buddy's trying to get me to hit the uh hit the waves somebody wrote um suggest a beginner's guide to meditation um, well, you know, even Jack Kornfield's written some good stuff. Um, there's, you know, there's definitely a lot of Western Buddhist teachers that have kind of been these like aggregated collections of their talks or whatever that are little, but, uh, maybe we could post something or do a, can we like put a list of things? Cause there's a bunch of things you could, we, we could recommend. Yeah, um, you could, you could write in the comments if you, if you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi guys, we do see your comments. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let, let me think about like what did I? I really like a path with heart um, by Jack Cornfield. Actually, that's oh a great, yeah, that's a great book. Um, Be here now, you know, as that oh the yeah spiritual cookbook has yeah. all the different practices in it. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I mean, even like uh, the power of now, I mean, it doesn't get into a meditation practice. Yeah. But like, uh, you know, uh, my like go to Bible spiritual book is when things fall apart, Pema Chodron, which oh, has wow. basic meditation practice as well. Um, 
That ha that's a good one. I'm just going to write this in. The serial killer. Um, was that Mila Rapa? Mila Rapa, yeah. Who is supposedly an enlightened being, became an enlightened being, worked through all of his karma in his lifetime. Yeah, right. He's the example of how far you can come in one life. Like, if you're willing to do the work, this dude was like the bottom of the barrel, and he had a full, he fully did it, you know, which, so you're never too far gone, which is, it's a beautiful story, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow, Kevin Warren. Hey. All right, Matt. Well, uh, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. It's nice to catch up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a way to, the, if this gets saved or something, could I comment on stuff after? Or Okay. It's going to be live on my story for about 24 hours, but I'm recording okay. all these and posting them. Perfect. Oh, then I can go back on there and comment and stuff. Yeah, so we'll go back and I'll do that. I'll just go through everything and try and um, respond to everybody. I'm sorry we've been in our, in a, Jake and I, we fall into this, man. He's, my, <laughs> you're a brother, you know, it's like, I feel like I'm in a room with you and we're just having a conversation, you know, and there was so much more to talk about. I feel like we just scratched the surface, but we can do this another time for sure. Yeah, let's definitely do this another time. Let's talk more about aliens next time. I know. We got to get into the crop circles and extraterrestrials. I mean, that's a whole thing. That's that's its own <laughs> that's its own one, you know. For sure. Right on. Cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and yeah, I'm working on getting these posted as soon as I, I can. So uh, yeah, I'll send you a link when it's up. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Good to see you. Good to see you yeah. too, man. Blessings. Be yeah, well. blessings, brother. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Up. so we did it guys that was another episode of the quarantine sessions podcast i am the host my name is jake cobrin i want to thank you again for tuning in and listening to this episode and i hope that this was a valuable experience for you if you're interested you can watch these podcasts live on instagram i am doing between three and four live podcasts per week and if you want to find that my instagram account is underscore dot cobrin dot underscore just for aesthetic embellishment and please subscribe to this podcast so that you can be notified of further episodes and that's about it many blessings to you wherever you might be i love you guys thank you so much for listening be well <laughs>